Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the 31st Historic Calgary Week. My name is Mackenzie, and I would like to thank you all for coming to Painting Climate Change in the Canadian Rockies. Now, I would like to introduce you all to the speaker, Caroline Hayden. Caroline is a Canmore-based director, producer, and science communicator driven to explore the human dimensions of conservation. She recently directed an award-winning web series for Parks Canada about the return of bison to Banff National Park and is currently working on a short film called Rockies Repeat that explores the cultural impacts of climate change. Her work has appeared on National Geographic Voices blog, Banff Centre for Arts and Creativity, the Banff Park Museum, and the Toronto Zoo. Welcome, Caroline, and we're all excited to hear your presentation. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you to the Chinook County Historical Society for uh, welcoming me here along with the Calgary Public Library. It is so amazing to be part of Historic Calgary Week and um, to tell you about what I've been working on, uh, which is an upcoming short film called Rocky's Repeat, uh, which bears witness to climate change through the eyes of emerging artists. So in today's presentation, we are gonna be going beyond the, con the confines of uh, the city of Calgary uh, and deep into the Rocky Mountains, although virtually. <laughs> um, but before we start, um, I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes and think of the word Alberta and the first thing that pops into your mind. It's so just close your eyes and think about it. Now, for some of you, um, I was born and raised in Calgary, and this is one of the first things that comes to my mind. And a lot of the reason that draws people to uh, come to Calgary to live or to visit, uh, it is that like classic skyline of the Rockies in the distance, uh, on those clear bluebird days, and that feeling that you get when you get in your car and you drive towards um, the Rockies and you see the foothills unrolling in front of you and that classic uh, Rocky Mountain view. And if it wasn't this that came to mind, maybe it was something like this, um, which is one of our iconic Alpine lakes, Moraine Lake, or maybe it was Lake Louise. But I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that it wasn't something like this, uh, which is what we're seeing today. Um, we've been smoked in this entire month. Uh, and it's something that I have never experienced. I, as I mentioned, was born in Calgary. And I never remember experiencing something like this. Um, or any of these things. So that this persistent low quality of air just due to all of that climate change and do smoke. Wildfires so strong that they're creating their own weather systems, which is incredibly rare. And of course the heat dome that we had the unusual pleasure of experiencing. Um, and I've never felt temperatures that hot in my life and never thought I'd be experiencing them here in Alberta. But one thing you still can see, like whether you're in Canmore, where I'm currently based, or if you're in Calgary, if you look out your window, you can still see the Bow River that connects our communities from Banff all the way down to Calgary and beyond. And we depend on rivers just like this that flow from the heart of the Rockies. And that same goes if you're if you're calling in from Edmonton um, and through all these communities throughout Alberta, we depend on uh, our river systems. And we'll just take the Bow for example. So the Bow River that flows through Calgary originates in a place called Bow Lake, um, aptly named. And Bow Lake is fed by the Bow Glacier. And unfortunately, um, the Bow Glaciers, like all of the glaciers throughout the Rockies and around the world are imperiled. Um, and according to um, the most recent projections, by 2100, we are on target to lose every single one of our glaciers for the most part um, in the King and Rockies. And that is a huge deal because the Rocky or the, the glaciers are basically, it's basically our water insurance policy. Uh, so after we've gone through all of that snow melt in that early spring, it's the glaciers that feed our river systems and takes us through our summer months and into the fall. And as summers get hotter and hotter, we are really going to depend on a reliable water source. And it's not just us, it's also all of the ecosystems that feed off of um, the river system. So we've got fish and bears and 
frogs that are all part of these rich and diverse ecosystems. And we've also got our human systems. So agriculture, ranching, um, it all depends on stable water. And even just in our own life experiences, I grew up frolicking in creeks and streams and coming up to the mountains um, to go for a swim. Um, and it's those memories that we build in relation to water and in relation to place that also depends on the health of um, our watersheds. So I know that we've all seen images like this of the, the, the dire plight of the polar bears and the melting ice caps and it makes climate change seem so far away. And, and it did that for me as well. And so what we're doing in our project is trying to bring climate change home and open our collective eyes um, to the really dire impacts that are happening right in, in our backyard. Uh, and that threaten not just our ecological systems, but also our cultural systems, our sense of place and our relation to our, even our own memories uh, and it's into the past. All of that is at stake. So that's what we're exploring in Rocky's Repeat. Um, we are going to touch a little bit on those, those ecological impacts, but we're really curious about how climate change and rapid climate change will impact our mountain cultures and um, what role artists can play as culture builders and recorders uh, in this moment to document climate change, to raise awareness about climate change and how we relate to mountains in such a rapidly changing landscape. And of course, uh, another uh, aspect of this of that is at risk and so precious is the indigenous cultural relations to, to the land. Um, from Tree 7 and beyond, uh, Indigenous peoples have been in relation to the mountains since time immemorial. These places are just so embedded with stories and memories and medicine and knowledge. And of course that knowledge is still alive today, but we need to really work to ensure that we can keep those connections and those stories alive in a rapidly changing place. So I would like to introduce you to our artist team. Uh, for the past two years, I've been following as a filmmaker, uh, this incredible group of artists who are both indigenous and non-indigenous from the Treaty 7 area, as they are working to document the impacts of climate change in the Rockies. Um, and they're all working in different, different disciplines and they just all have such diverse perspectives, both from their heritage and then from their practices. Uh, so on the left there, we have Shan Beresfra from the Stony Nation, who's a traditional tattooist uh, and um, an acrylic painter. We have Ariel Hill, who actually hails from uh, the Odawa Nation on Manitoulin Island, and she is a glass blower. We have Carrie Langua, who is a minimalist painter based in Canmore. Kayla Ecklebloom, a modern landscape painter also based in Canmore. Sikapanaki Lohorn, who is a traditional dancer and storyteller from Six Sika Nation. And lastly, we have Emily Baudouin, uh, who is a watercolorist currently living in Revelstoke. So what we are doing is revisiting the work of early um, Banff artist, Catherine Rob White, who has had such a huge impact on um, what we understand as mountain art and, and that early kind of mountain culture. Um, and so Catherine, um, and if anyone has been to the White Museum in Banff, that's her namesake museum. Um, she grew up in, on the East Coast of the States and was a budding artist, moved out to Banff and started this life um, as a creator in a time where women were more expected to be in the home, uh, but she was on horseback going out to places that are now very familiar to us, like Lake O'Hara. Um, and she was going out with her partner, Peter White and the group of seven. And she just created such beautiful uh, plain air paintings of um, the Rockies that are so richly textured and um, absolutely beautiful. And there's actually an exhibit right now on about her work at the White Museum. So if you wanna come to Banff, definitely check it out. 
So we are revisiting those exact landscapes. It's nearly been a century since she was painting in those places. Um, and we're going back using Google Maps, finding the exact location where she painted. Um, and our study area stretches as far north as the, um, the ice fields and all the way south to Lake O'Hara area. And we've, we go to these places, we have a little print of her original painting and we try to line it up on the landscape. Um, and we're not trying to recreate her work, but create new interpretations of how the, this group of artists sees the landscape with modern eyes. And for this project, what we're trying to do is threefold. Um, it's to elevate indigenous voices and because often, the rich indigenous culture and histories of these places is left out of the way we understand our relation to the mountains. Uh, while paying tribute to creators like Catherine Rob White that opened the door for this new generation of, of women artists um, to have the, the courage and the ability to get into mountain places. And lastly, and most importantly, to raise climate awareness. Um, because we're not talking about a climate future at this point so that we have to worry about in 2100, it's happening right now. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories from the field uh, without giving everything away so that you can watch the film and, and still be surprised. Um, but the first comes to you from Lake O'Hara. So if you've been there before, it's a place where you have to wake up at 5 a.m. to like book your spot on the bus to be able to get there and it attracts people from all over the world. Um, and it's just absolutely stunning. So this past fall, we took the team up there and it also happened to be during a smoke event. So this is kind of what we were expecting, this like crisp um, landscape with rich colors. And this is what we experienced. Um, it was so smoky that, and it was even smokier than it is now. Like our eyes were all irritated. It was really difficult to breathe. And it just had this ominous darkness about it. And also it happened to be the pandemic. So it was just, up, just our team up there and it just felt so haunted and spooky. Um, and we um, went up to a place called Lake MacArthur. Um, in conditions like this. So we could hardly see our one foot in front of the other. Um, and it was just very disorienting not to recognize the place that we were in. And when we arrived at Lake MacArthur, again, we held up that original painting uh, in front of the landscape. But instead of that, that crystal clear water and with very distinct shapes and that those recognizable shapes that we were expecting to see. This is what we actually saw. Um, so in Catherine's original painting, um, this was in the 30s, you, the, um, the Biddle Glacier was basically touching the water. And when we went up there, we were, when you've seen that painting so often, that's what you expect to see. Um, but I mean, we could hardly see see the, the glacier because there was so much smoke, which just felt a bit ironic. Um, but that really hit us and it made it so obvious like how rapidly these places are changing. And the artist described this feeling of panic of trying to use their, their, their skills as creators to document what was seeing because what they were seeing because every single minute that we spent there, um, the glacier melted away a little bit more. Um, so there's a sense of duty as cultural makers for them to create um, a depiction of what is left because in a hundred years, what's gonna be there? Um, so there's, yeah, they felt this kind of race against time um, to be able to show this to future generations. And just again, as a, um, a, a reference, this photo was taken in 1918. And you can just see like how big and beautiful that glacier was. And just, it's so dramatic. Um, and that, that magic of, of seeing a glacier in that large of a form is something that's becoming farther and farther away for us to experience. 
And more recently, we came back from the Columbia Ice Field. And it was during the heat dome. Um, so this was the piece that we were looking to revisit. Um, and it has just has this power about it of this sweeping glacier and it just looks so alive and, um, and it's so textured. Um, and when I looked at the forecast, I like, could not believe it because one, I've never heard of temperatures that hot in Alberta, but going up the Icefields Parkway, like feels sacred and safe that, you know, it's oh, the weather's always going to be horrible. It's always going to be chilly. You're always wearing a puffy and a toque, no matter like what it's doing down in the valley. But sure enough, we arrived up at the ice field and it was 35 degrees and the air coming off the glacier was warm. Um, and it was just so different to this image that we have of what the ice field should look like. So this again was a photo taken uh, by A.O. Wheeler in about 1918. And it's so grand and it's just this wild place that is covered in ice. It's unlike anything you experience kind of day to day um, down deep in a valley. And there's just, there's something just so elemental and alive about a glacier in this state. But when we arrived and found the place more or less where Catherine would have painted, this is not at all what we experienced, nor is it even what I remembered from being a kid and going up there. This is what we saw. It was like a wasteland of rock and till and the glacier is so far back that it has bumped over this moraine rock face. Um, and it's just, it has just left its traces uh, in its wake. Um, and it was very emotional for us all just to feel so helpless in this extraordinary recession. Um, and it's scientists estimate that during that 10 day period of the heat dome, we lost about the equivalent of a, a month's worth of melt during that time. And that doesn't count like the rest of this month where it's been 30 degrees every single day. And you look at the forecast and it's 30 degrees every single day. And it's just, it's so bewildering. Um, and there was, it's so strange to have this kind of incongruous feeling of expecting to see something that matches your imagination and your memories and have it be so radically different. Um, and one of our artists, Cheyenne, was up when she was up there. She made this um, observation that I hadn't considered that she felt this kind of double recession, what, like feeling so helpless in the face of like what she was seeing up at the ice field. Because in her own life, she's learning to speak Stony Dakota, and one of her teachers who was passing on that language recently passed away. And she is feeling this rush to try to take in as much knowledge as possible and learn from the elders around her before they pass away. And that knowledge is lost. Um, so there's this parallel cultural recession in addition to this glacier recession. Um, and it just, it feels very symbolic and it just, yeah, really hit her that this feeling of loss is coming at her from all sides and all of the stories are, are kind of imbued in, in places um, in glacial landscapes without having familiar landmarks Our cultural knowledge of those places will also disappear. Um, and we also went to a different view of that same area. Um, and uh, again, it is just so heartbreaking and um, just a very stark difference. So on the left hand side, that is a work made by Kayla. And on the right hand side, you, you see Catherine's original work of uh, snow dome within the backdrop with um, the actual landscape. And 
there's just there's this loss of what is even available to a creator like as a landscape is changing so quickly the opportunity to paint and be inspired by a classic rocky mountain landscape covered in ice is going to become inaccessible uh, which is really at the detriment to our cultural knowledge So what is next? Um, we actually just wrapped up filming, um, which is very exciting. And now we are busily like cutting everything together um, to build our final film. Um, we are applying to go to the Banff Mountain Film Festival, um, which is very exciting. And we're also, we've also launched um, a youth challenge uh, to, to try to reach and inspire and empower as many um, people in the Bow Valley region and beyond. Um, Cause we know like youth are so um, terrified, terrified by climate change. And we, we really wanted to find a way to empower um, young creators so that you, you don't have to be a scientist or an engineer to make a difference in this moment. So we have launched this youth challenge um, in collaboration with the Canadian Rockies Youth Network. So if you have a youth in your life who is under the age of 21, um, you can send them to our website. And we have um, uh, made a, or like dropped the pins for all the locations that we've been to. So the challenge for youth is to use uh, Google Earth and virtually visit uh, one or all of the landscapes that we've been to, to create their own interpretation. Um, and they have until September 30th. We'll be choosing some of the top uh, submissions to include as part of a digital exhibit at the White Museum. Um, as part of that coming exhibit, I will show in the next slide. Um, and we're working on some great prizing. Um, so please do share that um, with anyone you think may be interested. And that is, there's no geographic limit. So you can share that um, as far and wide as possible. And then we are so excited to be part of an exhibition at the White Museum of the Canadian Rockies as part of the Exposure Photography Festival uh, in January, 2022. Uh, we will have, or you will have the chance to see Catherine White's original paintings alongside the, the artist team's interpretation. And we'll also be debuting the film there as well, if it is not part of the Bad Film Film Festival. Um, so definitely stay tuned for that. It's going to be very cool to see everyone's final work in the same place. Um, and I would love to thank all of our sponsors and partners. Um, it takes a lot of time and energy and money to make all of this possible. Um, so I'm just so indebted um, to all of those who are supporting us. Um, we are also continually looking for support. So if you have deep pockets or know someone who does and would maybe be interested in supporting us, please do get in contact with me um, and we can potentially add you to this beautiful list of supporters. Um, and in the meantime, uh, there are some ways you can follow us and learn more, more about our project and connect with us. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and you can go to our website to watch a teaser trailer of the film and read more about the artists and the work that we are up to. And that's rockiesrepeatfilm.com. And now I think we can open it up to a discussion. Thank you so much, Caroline. That was wonderful um, presentation. We do have first question from Jackie. Um, where did you get the idea for this project? That is a great question, Jackie. Um, it started more as a cultural exploration. I happen to be now engaged to Catherine's great, great nephew. Um, and I just was curious to learn more about Catherine's impact as a creator and connect to that deep, deep history that they have in the Bow Valley. Um, so when I first gathered the artists and we started going to locations, um, 
it started as kind of like a repeat cultural lens of observing how much the landscape, like how we interact with the landscape has changed in terms of visitation. Because in Catherine's day, again, as I mentioned, these places were so inaccessible. You'd have to take the train to Lake Louise, rent a horse and take a, the horse up to Bow Lake. And they were just this, these insane wild expeditions. And it's in that time, uh, women were still expected to wear long wool skirts. So there's all these wonderful stories of Catherine and, and those in her generation who were still thirsty for adventure and would go out on weeks long horse trips and they would wear pants. And there's this great story of Catherine writing back to her mother and she went to the, the department store and bought men's underwear and men's pants to wear on her horse. And, uh, but when they come back to town, they were, they changed back into their skirt. Um, but then once we went back to the, her locations and saw how much the landscape has changed, I was like, wow, this is mm -hmm. actually a climate project. And it, it blew my wildest imagination of how much things have actually changed. Interesting. Thank you. Um, and we have quite a few questions now. Um, we have a question from Avalon. Um, she says, my grandfather, father and brother have all worked in Banff National Park. We have pictures of each of them standing at the same point at the Athabasca Glacier. And it is stunning and uh, poignant how much it has changed even just over the past 40 years. Yeah, I and even in like, we have we're working with the University of Saskatchewan. They have a um, a world renowned lab called the Global, Global Water Futures Lab. It's based here in Camor, and it's all these water experts who are studying uh, climate change and water flows. And one of their PhD candidates, Caroline Abi Wake, came out with us on one of our field camps, and she, even as a scientist in the field, um, was describing how extraordinary the change is. And she was she was saying that as a scientist, she was expecting to see changes kind of, you know, every 10 years or like very slow change. Um, but the changes she's seeing is within a season. Um, so wow. she, at the beginning of a season, will go out um, with her instruments. And part of it is like a long measuring stick that you stick into the ice and it measures how much the glacier has changed vertically. And mm -hmm. last year, um, within a month, she went back to her study site and was not, it had melted so much that she wasn't able to reach the top of her instruments anymore. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of um, exceeding everyone's, ex everyone's worst nightmares, <laughs> really. Yeah. Even people who are studying it on, like, on the forefront of climate change, like it's, the change is happening so rapidly in the Canadian Rockies much like it is in, in the Arctic. So we are not immune from this at all. And we are going to be in big trouble once we lose the glaciers. Yes, very sad. Um, and we have another question from Jackie. Um, do you have a favorite Catherine painting? I do. Oh, do I have a print? Um, it's actually the one that I showed at the beginning that um, it actually doesn't really feature that many glaciers, but it's that view of Bow Lake and it's still very similar. Like out of all the places we went to, it felt the most familiar. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we found footage from like someone's random Super 8 camera that we're incorporating into the film. And it's from 1914 and it still looks familiar. So there's some places where there is this feeling of connectedness and familiarity, even that even though there is it's really substantial change. And that's, it's been really cool to see throughout time um, and to hear stories from our indigenous artists as well of this, this connection to these places that we all love so much that kind of transcends um, all this time between us, um, just that, that love for the same places. Thank you. Um, we also have a question from Wendy. Um, is there a time capsule? Uh, a component to the project uh, wherein people can make predictions for the year uh, 2100 um, as a means to communicate with people of that time. 
that is kind of what we're hoping to do with the project. Um, I mean, I it will be documented as part of the uh, the White Museum, um, but that was part of the the spirit behind doing a redocumentation because at this point, the, the uh, Catherine's work, although it is beautiful, is no longer it no longer represents what those places look like anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so, as a new team of artists. Um, and there's six of them. So it's kind of like a play on the group of seven, but it's like equal numbers of indigenous and non-indigenous artists. Um, but they can establish a new baseline that for the artists who come back in a hundred years, like maybe there'll be another repeat and um, who knows like how much things will have radically changed by then. Um, but we are doing a couple of things. So we, we will have um, a digital exhibit. So anyone, uh, so all the materials will be digitized. We're gonna we're working on some kind of some behind the scenes stories and videos, and that will be on the White Museum's new digital interface. So um, if you go to explore.white.org, they have started like through COVID. It's been actually a great um, new tool that they have. Um, they started digitizing all of their feature exhibits, so you can explore mm -hmm. exhibits even if you're not there. So we'll have the work documented as part of that. And then um, in that new exhibit, uh, start, so that starts in January 2022. Thank you. Well, in a way, that is that is a kind of that kind of communication. If Catherine spoke to us through her mm -hmm. uh, paintings, how it looked like then, and now we see how it looks like now, and other artists are showing that, that will be a message to the people in 100 years or so. Thank you. Um, and Mackenzie asked, um, how did all the artists get involved with the project? Uh, did you approach them or how did the artists that uh, were chosen affect to the direction of the documentary? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it's, I mean, it started kind of as a COVID project to, um, to have like a small time frame creative project. And I happen, the, the Bow Valley attracts so many creative people and Foss, there's just this spirit of artistry here because um, the place is so inspiring. So I luckily had this um, existing crew of friends who were like practicing artists or emerging artists. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we extended the project, so now it's now been two years, um, we actually had to, do some artist calls because we really wanted to ex extend the team to be half indigenous, half non-indigenous. So we did actually do a formal artist call and extended it as widely as possible. Um, and yeah, I also wanted to reflect that our methods of creating um, as modern uh, modern artists has changed a lot mm -hmm. since Catherine's time. And there are so many new ways that artists express themselves and express their connection to the landscape. And one of our artists, Ariel Hill, she's a glass-based artist. So she's she creates these landscape-inspired glass sculptures. And she described her practice as kind of like a modern, like contemporary indigenous practice where she takes her kind of cultural values of reciprocity and connecting with the land and is using, like expressing that in a completely contemporary different form. And that's just so exciting. And we actually, mm -hmm. we did a magic of television thing and she pre-created a piece inspired by melting glaciers. And we brought it up to the Columbia ice field when we did our trip there and she held up in the light and just the way that it reflected the melting glacier and let some light in, and it just looked like this living being, um, which is, and that practice was just not something that would have been common or I can't even, I don't even know when it was invented, but um, that was just not a way that landscape artists expressed themselves in Catherine's day. So it's exciting to not only see the landscape through new mm -hmm. eyes, but through new practices. Interesting. Sounds also interesting. Um, 
We have a question from Walt. Um, how does the indigenous perspective differ from, say, the perspective of the rest of your team on the changes you see there? It's on a totally different level. I mean, on in some ways, we're all connected, as I was just mentioning earlier, in our love and appreciation and awe of being um, in these alpine environments. But something that blew my mind away, like as a non-Indigenous person, like a lot of the cultural stories of connections to mountain places are hidden and have been disrupted due to colonialism and the impacts of residential schools. Um, but one of our artists, the Kapanaki Lohorn, is a storykeeper. So she's been told, uh, they've been passed down um, so many stories from their elders and mm -hmm. one of them I had not ne like never even heard of like and I live by the Bow River and when you grew up beside something you think like from your own perspective you know it mm -hmm. but they were telling the story of their knowledge of the landscape and that um, back in the day um, her ancestors would go into the mountains to harvest teepee poles um, and then would put them into the Bow River and ride back home onto the plains and then harvest the teepee poles out of the Bow River so that they could have um, lodges and teepees because on the prairies, there's not a lot of trees. Um, and that is this connection to place that I would never have known had we not brought that perspective into the project and just makes that um, uh what we're trying to capture so much deeper and so much more meaningful and to be yeah. able to like document those stories so that, they, that knowledge is can, may also be uh, passed down and it, it help it makes my experience too um, so much richer and mm -hmm. yeah I just so appreciated learning and ha just having that that sharing of stories and, and knowledge um, and yeah, it was, it was so beautiful. Um, yeah, the whole learning. Um, thank you. Um, but Mackenzie also asked, um, will the documentary be available digitally when it is released? It will not be, um, so that we are able to apply to festivals. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, it will be... Um, on display at the White Museum. Uh, so that will be something that you need to go in person to, which I highly encourage you to do. Uh, and it'll be screened there. And then after we finish on the festival circuit, um, then it will be available digitally, but digitally, but there will be a bit of a lag time. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, is, there, um, is there any other question uh, from from our audience. That is all so wonderful, such a wonderful project. Um, truly. Well, thank you and thank you for having me. Uh, Jackie asked, have you done um, other projects like this or is this the first one? Well, it is very exciting because it's like the art, like the artist team. Um, I'm also an emerging artist. Um, so I worked with Parks Canada for a long time and, and got my you know feet wet in the filmmaking world. Um, but now this is my first independent project. So it feels, I feel very excited to have, to come out of COVID and have cut my first film. It's very exciting. <laughs> mm -hmm. And hopefully not the last one. Yeah, I'm sure it won't be. <laughs> um, that's nice. Well, thank you so much, uh, Caroline. Um, if, if there's any other last, uh, last minute question or comment, please send it to us. Um, otherwise, I would uh, really just like to thank you uh, for this presentation and conversation after. Um, I also would like to thank everyone um, who joined us and who sent us these questions. Um, and uh, I would just like to ask Mackenzie now to take over.
please remember to check out our website at chinookhistory.ca for information regarding all HCW programming, virtual and in person. You'll also find a listing of our valuable supporters, how to join our society, and how to support our programs.